To illustrate the semi-empirical approach, we're now going to consider a special kind of quantum system that involves uh, polyenes, that is to say, a conjugated pi system. So let me indicate that up here. Okay, when a system is conjugated, that means that it has alternating single and double bonds. And so that's a special kind of system that we encounter a lot, especially in organic chemistry. And uh, so there are some reasons why we may want to know more about the quantum mechanics of those systems. Now, what we want to first do is take advantage of some of the things, some of the qualities that we normally associate with conjugated pi systems. First of all, they are made of a planar framework of carbon atoms. Okay, and the planarity is actually very important uh, to the stability and the uh, properties that we uh, commonly observed, commonly observe in conjugated pi systems. Now, I should note that the p orbitals that we will be mostly concerned with are perpendicular to this plane. All right, so uh, this helps set the stage for the sorts of atomic orbitals that we're going to need in order to treat this system. The conjugation. Okay, which I said is alternating single and double bonds, basically leads to enhanced, enhanced energy stabilization. So in other words, um, we can use, for example, heats of formation maps to understand that, in fact, uh, when we have a conjugated system, there's some kind of special energy bonus that we get from that, uh, from having the alternating single and double bonds, as opposed to uh, simply having double bonds spaced more widely apart. So it turns out that cyclic pi systems, so cyclic conjugated pi systems, may have an even greater enhancement of this stabilization, a greater enhancement uh, of the energy. And of course, this is something that uh, some of you will already recognize as being a prelude to talking about aromaticity. So the real question is, can we use quantum mechanics to really understand what it means to be an aromatic compound? All right, now, a last one, and uh, this is one we won't get to explore so much, but I should mention, and that is that electronic transitions in these systems often occur in the visible part of the, of the spectrum. So a lot of organic molecules, a lot of molecules in other, in other types of chemistry, uh, don't necessarily have a color. But these molecules with conjugated pi systems, actually many of them do have a color. Uh, it's not the only type of, also not the only way you can generate a color with a chemical compound, uh, but this is one of the ways. So what we want to do is noting these properties for these conjugated pi systems, how can we go about uh, creating a model, a quantum mechanical model that will actually help us understand these? Okay, well the first uh, I should mention that Eric Huckel was the one that uh, first established this method uh, back in the 1930s. So this has been around for almost 100 years now. And it's almost getting to be ancient history. But um, what he proposed in his model was one to treat separately the sigma and the pi molecular orbitals. So in other words, focus on the pi system and uh, do that uh, uh, with the quantum mechanical treatment. So in some sense, we're going to treat the, the sigma MOs empirically and the pi MOs will treat uh, semi-empirically or, or quantum mechanically. So, so that's how he would divide these systems up. A second approximation, and this is one that I mentioned is common to semi-empirical methods, is we're going to use NDO, which stands for Neglect of Differential Overlap. So what this really means is that these given uh, values of the overlap integrals, okay, and I, maybe I should write that out, it's basically just these functions, that these are going to be equal to delta mn, or in other words, they're equal to 1 when m is equal to n and 0 when m doesn't equal n. 
And um, when these represent atomic orbitals on the same atom, they're all they're they're generally going to do this. Uh, we're going to have them um, be this delta function for m n because uh, they're orthonormal these uh, atomic orbitals. But when they're on different atoms, that's when they may not be ortho because they may not be orthogonal. They would certainly be normalized. All right, but so this approximation will simplify our secular determinant because now um, essentially this is just the identity operator so we'll only have the subtraction of E from the diagonal elements of the secular determinant. All right now the third part is that only adjacent carbons will be coupled to one another. Okay, let me write what that means mathematically, and then we can talk about it just a little bit. So in other words, I've got uh, different matrix elements. I've got different expectation values for H. And just to write down exactly what this is, is phi1, phi2 around H. Um, that this is going to be the only one, you know, the ones where they're one different in these, uh, in these numbers are the only ones that are going to be non-zero. But we will also set H12, H23, H34, and so forth. We're going to set all of these equal to the same number. We're going to set it equal to beta. And um, so look what this is doing. This is doing something very similar to what we saw in the exchange integral when we talked about diatomic molecules. We're using a Hamiltonian to connect two different basis functions in that Hamiltonian. So if this is like the exchange integral, uh, for that case, we can call it an exchange integral for this too. It also has a different name in conjunction with the Huckel theory, and that is sometimes it is called a resonance integral. All right, so you'll hear that term used for it sometimes as well. Now I'll note that uh, the value for beta uh, it depends upon the system, but generally speaking, this tends to be anywhere from 75 to about 160 kilojoules per mole is the value of this thing. So that gives you an idea roughly of uh, how much coupling there would be between adjacent uh, p orbitals on adjacent atoms. Okay, a fourth element of Huckel's model is the following. We're going to have the same expectation value for all for all of the p orbitals in this system. So what does that mean? Again, let me write this mathematically so that uh, so in other words, if I have something like HNN, which is just the integral of the Hamiltonian over this atomic orbital n, that this is going to be the same no matter which n it is. So for all n, and we're going to set it equal to a parameter that we're going to call alpha. All right, so you get alpha and beta. All right, in this case, um, we can relate this to uh, the Coulomb term that we saw earlier in the diatomic molecules. So this is a Coulomb integral of sorts, and it tends to have the value negative 11.4 electron volts, which is about 1,100 kilojoules per mole. Right, and I should have mentioned that the beta is also negative. So it's negative 75 to negative 160. So in other words, we have both alpha and beta less than zero in this particular model. And that's going to be important because when we're adding beta to alpha, we're actually getting a, a more negative number, so a lower number. Um, all right. So with these assumptions, um, what uh, you know, what will we get out of using this kind of uh, approach to calculating the energies? Well, first of all, it is not quantitative. That is to say, these are not quantitatively accurate. So the best you'll be able to do out of this is to compare different molecular orbitals and decide which one is higher energy and which one is lower energy. It does tell us something about trends as different parameters may vary in the model, but uh, it's not going to be a number that will be 
exactly matching something that you measure in, in the lab. All right, so what is the purpose of viewing an experiment uh, or doing uh, an approach like this if it only gives us qualitative uh, results? Okay, let me just partition another little part here. So why might we do this? All right, what we're going to be looking for are qualitative relationships between the various MOs. And I'll say more specifically between MO energies. All right, so we want to get an idea of how these things are related to one another. We may want to understand something about the MOs related to the pi system. All right, so this theory can tell us something about what those MOs look like and what uh, trends they may have. Um, we may want to have some verification of certain features. Okay, so what might those features include? Well, for example, why are conjugated molecules more stabilized energetically than non-conjugated molecules? So, so the stabilization that we find in these systems. That's something that we might be able to get some answer from Huckel theory for. All right, we may also want to see any differences between linear versus cyclic systems. We could also look at uh, the origin of aromaticity. Um, finally, we could get some insight into the spectroscopy of these molecules. Again, none of this will be quantitative, but all of it can help us understand better what makes these systems work and why they have the, uh, how they have the certain uh, features that they do. Now, one of the other things that this method would do is it's a simple method, so it's very easy to um, get analytic results, that is pencil and paper kinds of results, or to set it up for a larger system so that it's very easy to generate results from a computer. In fact, you could set it up as an Excel spreadsheet, for example. So one of the things that one could do is to adjust different parameters and, look, and see what effect that has on the overall results. So basically, it allows you to conduct something that I would call computer experiments on these kinds of systems. Now, when Huckel devised this, of course, there were no computers. So this was the way that one, you could, one could calculate certain quantum mechanical features of these systems. Um, but nowadays, you can calculate these things much more accurately using basic molecular orbital theory. And um, what one might take from these kinds of methods is greater insight into how they work.